Uh, welcome to uh, Comp 720's week seven lecture. This week's lecture is on sound and music. And you'll notice that I am not Charles Martin. Um, Charles and his partner have just had a baby. And so uh, he will be taking the next few weeks uh, on paternity leave. To give you a bit of an idea of who I am, um, my name's Kieran. Uh, I'm a code artist. I am a previous lecturer and tutor of this course. Um, so you're in safe hands. But uh, if you have any questions, of course, we still have uh, the discourse channel and uh, various other paths through which you can communicate with the administration of this course. So hello, nice to meet you. And um, let's get into the content. So just to cover a little bit of admin, uh, assignment two marks have been released. Um, assignment three is due on Tuesday, week nine. And I just want you guys to start thinking about the week nine storyboard lab. This is an important lab, it happens every year where you come into that class with your uh, storyboard all uh, kind of planned out and ready to go. You don't have, this doesn't have to be the final form of your major project, but you do need to come in with a plan so that you can discuss with your tutor and get some feedback at that point before you really start working on implementing it in code. So today we're talking about sound um, and you might be wondering why as a code artist you should care about sound. Well, sound grabs attention and it communicates emotion, creates atmosphere. It adds realism and, immer and immersion in, uh, in your code art and it gives crucial feedback during interactions. Um, as code artists, we get extra kind of powers that um, most kind of media arts don't uh, aren't, don't have to deal with and don't get to deal with. Um, you don't have to think about your soundscape so much when you're making a painting. Uh, you do actually with film and things like that, but uh, it's another layer that you can add to your work or it can be the focus of your work um, that can really uh, enhance the experience of an artwork. So, um, to give you an idea of what we're talking about, let me just move myself around here. Um, what, what sound comes to mind when you see this image? Um, we probably all can bring something to mind. And by the same token, once again, I'm just gonna shift myself over. Uh, this image probably, probably brings to mind a different kind of soundscape. So I'm just gonna play a part of this clip uh, this is about Foley artists, and that should motivate some of the stuff that we're talking about. I'll leave that there. There's actually a little bit more to that video that I'll encourage you all to go and watch in the lecture slides. Um, there's a bunch of interesting examples of the way that sound effects are produced for film and how your kind of mind is tricked into creating that atmosphere and that experience. So, um, there are lots of types of sound. Uh, some of this is going to be pretty obvious, but let's split them apart because it helps us to think about, think through what we might want to add to our sketch. So obviously there's musical sound, it's, um, there's abstract sound, there's kind of sound effects in that sense. Um, and then there's skeuomorphic sound and so, uh, sound effects in the sense of uh, sound that you would expect to, um, to hear in the real world. Um, abstract sound, I should say, is more like, um, well, that's an interesting line between abstract and musical, but uh, we might come up with some examples as, as we get through this. So if we're going to design a sonic experience for interaction, um, we need to ask some key questions that may not have been relevant to previous uh, types of code art we've been making. So one is what type of sound should we be making? Two is when when does it going when is it going to when when will it start and when will it stop? How high or how low and how loud should it be? Um, high and low meaning pitch. Uh, and as I said, uh, all of this sort of stuff has a particular set of lingo, set of um, terms that are more specific to a kind of to musicians and to sound effects artists. Uh, so if we're talking about high and low in sound, in terms of, uh, we might be talking about pitch, 
Um, high and low could also be amplitude in the sense of, is it really loud or is it extremely quiet? Um, we have duration of sound. Let me again shift my face around. So uh, uh, sound can be really uh, short, like a uh, like a beep or like a um, like a tap, or it could be very long, like a um, like a drawn out chord or you know a a soundscape, something like that. And we also have timbre. Um, it this word you might not have come across before, especially if you're not a native English speaker. Uh, Tambra is spelt timber, almost, um, and there's probably some etymological reason for that, but uh, it's the kind of quality of a sound, uh, or the color sometimes it's called, uh, that uh, allows you to identify what that sound actually is. And so, for example, when you hear the same note played on a piano or a violin, uh, it, has a, it has an entirely different quality, and that quality of sound that's identifiable to that instrument is called the timbre. So these are the questions we need to ask ourselves when we're designing for sound. What, when, how high, how loud? Um, again, we've kind of covered timbre, um, but you can think of timbre in terms of specific instruments, but also uh, synthesized and, and, and unnatural sounds and even kind of sampled sounds as such as the ocean or you know, the sound of rain have their own timbres as well. In making sound digitally, um, we have two main modes uh, in computer music, uh, including P5. And so that's synthesis. That's where we actually produce a sound mathematically with, with, with our code. And there's also sampling, which is when we play back a recorded sound. Um, so synthesis uh, really fundamentally begins with basic uh, sound waves, the sine tone, which is a very pure kind of sound and then we have square, triangle, and sawtooth, um, which have a more kind of buzzy quality, um, a more digital quality that you might identify. Um, and those kind of timbres can be mixed together to create more complicated, um, more complicated sounds. And so if you've ever heard a, a synthesizer, um, usually what that is doing is just combining a bunch of different kinds of simple waves, be they sine, sawtooth, square, and triangle. We can also sample sounds, whether that's taking samples off, offline or, um, or if it's going out into the world with a sound recorder and recording, you know, recording our noises and then mixing them back together later on. We have to think about control um, in our sketch because uh, is this the kind of thing that is happening at random generatively? Are we, are we playing back this sound in a, or producing the sound in a kind of generative fashion? Is it time-based? Uh, is it scene-based where as we move between one scene to another in our sketch, we're gonna create a different atmosphere with our sounds? Or is it direct input, uh, as in a keyboard or an input device, or maybe a kind of audio feedback when you click a button or something like that? Uh, we need to think about starting and stopping sound. Um, if you think about adding a sound to your sketch, um, if you add it every moment in the draw loop, you're going to be starting it repeatedly. And so, in reality, when we're playing, when we're dealing with sounds in our in our sketch in our draw loop, we need to be uh, explicit about the moment that it starts and the moment that it stops. So, with pitch, um, we are talking about how high and low um, pitches allow us to create music, especially in kind of synthesized sound. Although it's possible to uh, change the pitch of a sampled sound as well. And pitch can also communicate things like size and mood and that kind of thing. So, uh, you know, if you were to um, if you were to play some deep rumbling sounds, you might expect that might relate to some large, heavy thing context in the scene. By the same token, something light and small is more likely to have a high pitch sound. We talked about amplitude, which is how loud something is. Um, 
We can build tension by slowly changing the loudness of sound, um, building from quiet to loud or loud to quiet. Um, we can create accents in music by making sudden variations in loudness. Um, and when we use a wide range or when we use a range of loudness in our, uh, of amplitude in our, in our sketches, that's called dynamic range. And, and it tends to make, make our music or our soundscape more interesting. So, uh, the, a common thing you might want to do is, is use interaction in the context of sound, connect a sound input to the screen, connect your kind of keyboard and mouse to produce sounds in your sketch using a camera and accelerate, uh, accelerometer to make sounds. Um, and we can think about this as, you know, the key to creating some kind of new musical instrument because we're, uh, because we're using programming, we can really define the rules of engagement with our instrument. So, um, for example, someone in a previous year uh, made an instrument where you hold up different patches of color and by moving them around the screen, uh, you can control the pitch and the amplitude of of a sound. And so what that what that ends up producing is is essentially a musical instrument that you can play by moving through the space in front of the computer. So sound interaction examples. I'm um, just gonna I'll, let me, I'll maybe bring up a couple. This is a interesting one called Touch Pianist. Um, produced by, who does it say? Well, we could go into that later. And what this, what this does is um, you can use your keyboard to play a sound. And basically no matter what key you press, it'll pick the pitch for you. And so what it's giving you is actually control over the rhythm of the notes. So, I'm kind of going slowly through this. And I might want to build tension by kind of slowly pausing and then that kind of thing. So we can see how rhythm and the choice of spacing can affect the experience of a song. Just by the same token, if I was to go kind of rush through this, it might create a totally different experience of the same, essentially the same piece of music. So that's a bit of fun, especially if you are not a, um, are not a musician to kind of have that experience of playing, playing sounds that feels expressive, even though all you're really controlling is, is the, uh, the speed at which the sound is played. Let me actually open that just in a new tab. This is another example from Ableton, which you may know is a piece of software for producing music that's just on their website. And all you get to do is combine a bunch of um, samples together and you get a choice of four for each one. Really hear the bass very well in this, but and simply because all of these samples are in the same kind of key and pattern, um, we can play them all together in different ways. And pretty much any combination would work. So two very different interaction modes there. Um, but both kind of engaging simple instruments, sketches, that kind of thing. Uh, here's another video I probably, maybe I'll play just a little bit. The point of this is to think about how sound very subconsciously strongly is, is an important part of interaction design. And we actually, we recognize a lot of these sounds um, implicitly, even if we never really thought that much about them before. That's the THX sound. I like the tension resolution. 
uh, a little bit disconcerting. Like a palate cleanser. Like wake up, stop talking to one another. And then all of a sudden we're resolved on this, this really nice ending. It's like a gentle rub on the back. Everything's going to be okay. It'll be online soon. I think it's played on middle C, which is kind of chord that everyone's most used to hearing. Although I think it's been pitched down over the years. I believe it was stereo and then they brought it into mono. It's attention grabbing. You've been downloading something and it suddenly stops and it drops into your download folder. Now this is telling me that I've done something wrong. The decay is really, really final. It's in a lower frequency. It's very short. It is literally like a war. Isn't it? Mm. More of so I'm going to let you guys watch that in your own time instead of playing it through this lecture. But um, again, it's in the lecture slides. Uh, look it up. You can. It's 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 very fascinating to see how sound designers think through the way that you communicate a particular kind of event interaction mode just with the sound. And so, I mean that that error sound is a is a perfect example of uh, in the choices of pitch, the consonants, dissonance you know, decay, speed, amplitude, that kind of thing. Um, we know that we've done something wrong. Now, this is some clips from uh, NIME, which is a um, electronic music conference. Um, I'm probably, uh, probably not getting that exactly right. Uh, one of the unfortunate things about um, it being me this week is that uh, Charles is actually a um, electronic music researcher and does experimental uh, experimental work as his um, kind of research practice into uh, into exploratory new interaction modes, new software, things like that to make to make music. So again, I won't play the whole video because uh, the sound is really important in this clip and I think it's good to have it played directly through your earphones as opposed to out of my speakers and into a microphone. Um, but think of this as kind of like the pinnacle of um, what you can really achieve with programming and sound and especially once you move outside of just a simple kind of laptop based sketch and start connecting to external sensors. You can see that um, one of the people in that clip created this kind of like glowing spine um, mechanism that was in some way or other controlling a, um, a synthesizer. And so there's a lot that you can do, you know, with, with sound and, and digital systems. So code theory. Um, how do we do any of this sort of stuff in P5? Uh, we want to talk about synthesis and sampling and also interactive music. And what I'm going to do towards the end of the lecture is, um, is do a kind of live code experiment where we make some kind of simple instrument and we'll see how far we can get with that in the time that we have. So sound is different to graphics. We need to think about it in a different way. Um, and the reason a lot of the time comes down to the rate at which we experience sound versus graphics. So when we say frame rate, I hope you guys have met frame rate before. Um, when we're animating something in P5, if we change uh, what's drawn with the draw loop, every, you know, the standard um, frame rate in P5 is 60 frames per second, which is already pushing the limits of what we can perceive with our eyes. Um, it'll appear to move fluidly like an animation. Okay, so the the draw loop frame rate is sixty frames a second. Um, what's the normal frame rate of sound, or the the rate of sound, perhaps? It's actually between, you know, a low range would be forty four point one um, samples per second. That's kind of 
that's kind of the frame rate of uh, CD level digital quality um, and goes way higher than that, uh, you know, up to around 96,000 uh, um, samples per second. So, you know, 60 versus 44.1 thousand is an enormous, an enormous difference in the way that, in the kind of speed at which we're kind of experiencing these this this information this data so p5 has a library for dealing with sound it's called p5 sound um, and we're fortunate enough that when we set up the um, it's well supported by p5 and also it's well supported in this course in the sense that the uh, the p5 template that we gave you guys um, is more or less ready to go to work with sound uh, we'll show you that in a sec there's no draw loop. There's no explicit loop for working with sound. Um, it would be it would be far too slow. Um, it would have to run, like we said, at you know 44.1 thousand frames a second. And so we need to deal with uh, sound in a different way in our sketches. So P5 sound provides a bunch of building blocks, which are objects that you've already met, um, and they create the P5 sound library creates the objects for you and you can call methods of those objects in order to make things happen. Um, so we're gonna load the P5 sounds library in the index.html. So let me, let me go through that now. So uh, here is a standard kind of P5 template based on um, the comp 1720, you know, the standard one you've been using every week. And so if I just open up my assets folder here and I pull up the index.html and maybe I'll make this full screen for now. By default, we're pulling in the P5 library. You can see that here in this script tag. Uh, and just under that, there's a thing that says, this is the P5 sound library. And this bit of, um, you know, angle bracket, exclamation, dash, dash, that's making this a comment. So all we have to do is delete that bit and delete the bit from the end. And now, P5 sound library will be loaded into our sketch. It's as simple as that. Okay. So, what are the building blocks? We have sound sources, synthesizing a sine wave, playing a sound, fi uh, sound file, that kind of thing. We can process those sounds um, through things like envelopes and through adding you know, changing the balance of bass and midi, uh, middle and um, highs. We can add reverb and process sounds in those kinds of ways. And we can also um, deal with sound syncs. So we can save a sound to an MP3. We can play it through the speakers, you know. It's programming, so the sky's the limit, but those would be the two standard things that we'll be looking at today. So here's our first bit of example code. And we're going to talk about the P5 oscillator um, object, which creates a basic sound signal. Um, an oscillator uh, is a fancy word in, in I guess, sound designed for um, something that makes a sound. We know that sounds move in waves. And so think about an oscillator as something that goes up and down. And that should remind you of some kind of wave, probably a sine wave usually. So here's a simple sketch. Um, I'm going to copy parts of this in. We're just going to begin by opening up our sketch.js and creating a sound or declaring a variable for, called OSC, which is going to be our sound function, basically. It's going to be our oscillator. And in the setup, we are going to assign, create a new oscillator and assign it to that variable that we just declared. We are going to set it to be a sine wave using osc.setType. If you're unfamiliar with um, the method syntax, um, look back at the previous lecture where we discussed objects. And then the final, um, the final 
kind of thing to get us started is osc.start, which basically just means start making some noise. So let me see if I've got this running already. Let's see. I'm not hearing any sound, so let me just think about why that would be. Have I got, am I connected to the right thing? Hmm. I can't see anything. So what I'm going to do is open up the console and I'm going to see if I'm getting any errors. You know, I think I can hear something and it's probably, probably what is happening is that it is playing a sound, but it's almost indistinguishable to my ears. And so let's go back to that example and see if there's anything else that we need to, we should probably set the frequency and we should probably set the amplitude. So let's do that here. We started oscillating and let's set the frequency to 1000 and see what, what happens. I guess we'll try setting the amplitude as well. I'm pretty sure that was the syntax. Let's check. Yep. And the amp is going to be, I guess, one, I think it's. Hmm. That's interesting. see again if I'm getting any errors. Console. The audio context was not allowed to start. Now why would that be? I wonder if this is, you know, we had some trouble last year with some Chrome with some Chrome security preferences, which, you know, it's possible that you guys have already covered. Uh, so let me just see, what have we got going on here? Sound automatic. I'm gonna try, I'm just gonna see what happens if I open this in Firefox, just in case as a bit of a sanity check. And if I allow that to run. Okay, so we are getting a sound now. So I, I don't know if we have covered um, issues around that, that issue with Chrome in class so far, but if you have the issue, I, oh, Firefox just closed. So I think we've got Chrome working all of a sudden. Okay, let's set that to zero. I don't know what I changed, but Chrome seems to be working now. So let's continue onwards and upwards. And if you do have any similar issues, um, post them on the discourse server, and I'm sure, I'm sure our tutors will be able to work out the deal. Okay, so we have our oscillator. We set it to a sine wave. We started it, and then we set the frequency and amplitude. But what we can do now in the draw loop is actually change the frequency and change the amplitude in interesting ways. So what I'm gonna do is set the frequency to mouse X and I'm going to set the amplitude to mouse Y. Mouse Y, and I better divide this because I know that one is the full, as, as loud as it can get. So um, I'm gonna divide it by the height. So that means I can't, this number, this amplitude value can't get any higher than, um, it can't get any higher than one because I can't get my mouse outside the height any higher than the height of the sketch. So 
so you can see how simple it is to kind of create, you know, not the most compelling sketch in the world, but something that's 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 truly playable, like a um, like an instrument. Whether you can, you know, it has a similar kind of effect as um, as a theremin, which is kind of a radio instrument where people wave their hands around. Um, and there are some people who can play those like an actual violin, but um, that's not me, I'm afraid. So, what did we what do we get from this? Um, the basic synthesis parameters is you create an, a, an oscillator. Um, we want to set the type. We want to start it. There's also a stop method. Um, if for some reason, you know, we say move it to a different point in our scene and we want to stop it from playing from now on and we can set the frequency and amplitude. And if we look at the reference, um, there's a lot more that you can do with P5 sounds that we won't cover in this lecture. I just want to show you briefly, um, we used a sign, but there's also, if we just look back, what are some other options? There's triangle, sawtooth, and square. And so sign, as you can hopefully hear, is a fairly clear, pure tone, but a square wave is a bit, sounds a bit more digital. It sounds a bit more rough. So if we show this. It's still, it's still clearly tuned. Um, it's still clearly tuned like a, um, like the sine wave was, but it sounds a bit rougher and a bit more digital and a bit more synthesized. So, I think that's quiet enough. Yeah, so to make a sound by synthesis parameters, we create an oscillator. We say what type of oscillator it's gonna be, what type of wave it's gonna be. We start the sound, we set the frequency, we set the amplitude, which is how loud it's gonna be. And we can also sample sounds, okay? So we can load sounds in a sound file into a P5 sound file object. Um, and using this, we can play back, you know, audio files like MP3, WAVs, that kind of thing. So in this example, we're gonna be playing a sound called Shimmer. So let me kind of create some of these pieces in our code. I'm gonna create a declare a variable. That's where we're gonna save this shimmer sound file object. Um, we're going to load the sound and I'm just gonna put that in the setup for now and we'll see why that's gonna be an issue shortly. And I'm also going to um, set the volume and press play. Now, this seems reasonable enough, but what we'll actually get or what we should get when we reload this is an error. So if I open up the developer console again, you can see we've got a little error there and it says uncaught in promise, not ready to play file. Buffer has yet to load, try preload. So this is actually a pretty good um, error message. It tells us pretty much exactly what we did wrong and how we should fix it. So let's, let's go and make that change. This may be the first time, I'm not actually sure. It depends if you guys have met, um, have used images before and loading that kind of thing or other kinds of files. But when we load uh, data in our P5 sketch, we need to use an additional function beyond setup and draw. And that's called preload. And the reason we use preload is because if we, when setup runs, which is straight away, or it is straight away unless we've included a preload function, it's going to try to use this sound file, but the sound file is still getting from the server that we're loading it from all the way to our computer. So even though it's almost instantaneous anyway, you can hear that I've just saved it and then that shimmer sound is playing. Um, we still need to preload it, otherwise setup's gonna try and use that object before it's ready. That's why we get the error. So we're loading the sound in preload. We need to make sure it's in our assets folder. And we need to, um, you know, we actually need to make sure there's a file there. If you can see here on my left-hand side, I've, I've loaded a bunch of WAV files 
into my assets for this lecture. And so we've got hi-hat and kick and snare and so on. And so hopefully we'll get to using those in a bit. And shimmer is just a sound. We can't display it as such, but it's just a sound that we're using in this case, um, you know, to show a simple example of loading a sound. Interestingly enough, it's not playing this time. Hmm. Have I gone back to the issue before? Yeah, audio contacts not allowed to start. It must be resumed or created after a gesture on the page. Okay, so I think the issue that I was having before seems to relate to whether this is being automatically created. Yeah, so it'll only work after after I've just used the page and that's probably a security feature to stop nasty websites from doing sneaky things on your computer. So thanks Chrome. That's gonna be a bit of a trip up um, for some of our students maybe, but as long as you're aware that that can happen, uh, the fix appears to be make an action on the page if it's not playing and then try again. All right, so onwards and upwards. So we can play a sound file in this way. Let's look at um, the sampling parameters of the P5 sound file object. So it's pretty straightforward. We load our sound into the um, variable that we declared in the global scope. It tells the, um, the computer what sound to make, um, which will depend on the sound file that you've put in your assets folder. It'll say when to start and stop with the play method. Um, we don't have to stop it. It'll stop automatically when it runs out. Um, we can say, you know, the bit rate to use when playing back the file. And also we can set the volume, um, which I don't think we're doing in this. So maybe that's worth doing given that, oh no, we are setting the volume to 0.5. Let's set it to 0.9. Bit too loud, 0.2 maybe, that kind of thing. So we've learnt about the, some, some interesting differences between the sound file and the oscillator um, variable. It's a bit frustrating, I think, that uh, you set the volume of a P5 sound file object, but you set the amplitude of a P5 oscillator. But those two things really relate to the exact same fundamental feature of the sound, which is its volume. Okay, so why, why are we using the, this preload function? Um, I did kind of hint at it before. We've been talking a lot about the setup and the draw, which is the flow of P5. So you, the setup function runs once right at the beginning, and then we go draw, 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 draw at around 60 frames a second, assuming your computer can keep up with it. But when we're loading files, um, we need to use the preload function. And as I said, that's because if we try and use that feature, that file um, in our setup or our draw function before it's actually been loaded properly, we're going to get an error. So let's think about um, some, yeah, this is because of the way the browser works is it actually loads that file um, usually from a server that could be far away. And so it needs to have asynchronous, um, you know, methods that allow it to work with that, you know, possible latency. Now, where should we start the play? You, we've got an example. Um, where should we start playing the, uh, the file, the, the sound object? We could put it in preload, in setup, in draw, or in mouse pressed. Now, <clears throat> there's, I would say there's two, uh, there's two wrong answers to this question and uh, one kind of partially right, one partially right answer. So we can actually find out pretty easily what will happen if we start moving around the shimmer.play um, call. 
So here it is, I'm going to move it up into preload. And so what we're gonna see now is that what we're gonna try and do is load, load the sound and then immediately play it. And so my prediction is that we heard nothing played. The issue is, oops, let me just, um, let me just make sure that that can't play. So when we do it in this way, in the preload function, again, we're not gonna be ready to play the file because the way that P5 is going to read this is it's going to try and load this sound file and then immediately try and use it. So the preload function is a way of declaring some things and then what this will do is it'll actually stall and wait for all of those files to be loaded properly before it moves on to running the setup function. So setup would be a good place to put it. Um, why would we not want to put it in the draw function? Certainly if we put it in the draw function, um, we wouldn't have the issue where it would be loading too fast because it's going to preload and finish loading this file and then setup's going to run and then we're going to put it in the draw loop. So the, the sound file is going to be ready and it's going to play. But what we'll find is every 60th of a second, it's going to be trying to restart this file and we're going to get a horrible noise. So you can hear that crackling. Um, you can hear a bunch of kind of the samples playing over each other, some starting and stopping. The computer not really knowing how to deal with it. It's getting more and more extreme. So I'm going to stop that now. Not a nice sound. Um, and again, what's happening there is that every 60th of a, of a second, every time we run through this draw loop, it's trying to start that play again. And so this is the sense in which we can't just use our sound objects in the way that we can use our drawing functions um, because we're going to get some issues. Now, last one is um, mouse pressed. Could we put it there? I would say, yeah, we can. Mouse pressed. And if we put it in there, this is going to work reasonably well. I don't know what's gonna happen if I try and click as soon as it's started. It seems like it's, it seems like it works. So I would say that that is a, another tick. Um, and all this does is that the flow of this sketch is, um, is now preload, load the file, go through the setup and the draw, and then on a frame where you've clicked the mouse, it's going to play that sound. Now, there's a bunch more in the P5 sound library. Um, the reference has a full list of things you can do, filter, envelope, reverb, decay, delay things. FFT is a way of pulling, extracting the audio spectrum, and you can do that from a sound file and, some, and, and also generated sound. So that would be a way of creating a music visualizer, um, taking the values of different pitches and then representing that on your screen in some way. Audio in is a way of, well, it says have a guess, but I'm just gonna tell you because there's no one here to guess. Um, it's a way of getting audio in like a mic or like a, um, you know, some other audio input. Usually it's a mic. Sometimes it's gonna be some kind of external, you know, audio sequencer box. Um, and we have different kinds of synthesizers that we can use as well, uh, which are a little bit more advanced than using a simple oscillator, but they allow you to make the kind of complex, um, richer, more detailed sounds that you can get out of a full synthesizer, as opposed to just, you know, sine wave, square wave, triangle wave, um, sawtooth wave. So, have we covered all there is to know about sound? Absolutely not. There is, a, it's, a, it's a whole wild world out there. And um, if, if sound is something that interests you and you want to learn more about it and you want it to be a big part of your major project, um, a big part of your kind of creative work in this course, then I strongly encourage you to look 
dig deeper, look at some examples on the P5 website, maybe even Google around for some other examples out there and see what you can really do because, um, you know, it's, it's a fascinating way to, to create interesting, interesting interactive artwork. But we have the building blocks and we know how to make the P5 sound. We know how to use the P5 sound library in basic form. So that's kind of the basis of what we wanted to cover in this lecture. Um, if you are going to use other people's work, that means, you know, getting other people's sound art code or especially, especially common is, you know, getting other people's music or getting other people's samples from online. You need to make sure that it's not a breach of copyright. So you need to make sure it's something that's under Creative Commons and or you know something that's you know free use, fair use. And you also need to put it in your statement of originality, even if it's just a click, even if it's just a little sound that you know seems very innocuous. You need to specify any time that you use um, someone else's work, even if it's an image or a sound file. You need to put that in your statement of originality for any of the assignments that you submit, okay? So, um, there's a bunch of further reading that you can do. So I'm just gonna leave in here. I'm not gonna go through them. Um, freesound.org is a great um, resource for finding sounds online. That's where I got the sounds for the assets in this thing, including the, the kind of drum sounds and the shimmer sounds that I played before. Uh, there's aside from that there's some good reading that you can check out as well as the P5 examples page and here's some more like excellent work that's done with sound art that I'm sure will be covered in more depth uh, in Tony's lecture so questions can be put on the discourse forum or on teams um, but for now let's dive into a quick uh, a quick uh, live coding and we'll see if we can make something interesting. So what I wanna do in the live coding today, I'm going to try and bring this up so that we can see both at once. I wanna create some kind of basic instrument. So let me just delete most of the stuff that we've got so far. Don't need that. And you know, we'll, we'll start from scratch and we'll pull out anything from the examples if we need it when it comes up. So what I'm thinking of is, well, I probably, I wanna make some kind of instrument. And for now, you know, we're taking inspiration from the real world. So I wanna make something that seems, you know, intuitive to play. And so what we might do is create some kind of xylophone or glockenspiel, you know, the, the kind of, um, the instrument that's made up of a series of wooden or metal blocks that you hit and they make a little tuned sound. So what I wanna do first is create a background. Background, uh, it's gonna be 255, which is white. And I'm gonna use a for loop um, because I want to uh, I want to make a series of things and I don't want to write it out over and over and over again. So i is less than, i equals zero, i is less than seven. Uh, I'm going to have about seven notes. We can always adjust that later. i plus plus. Okay. So a to make a xylophone, we're looking for kind of rectangular, approximately rectangular blocks that are going to be the kind of interaction buttons. So what's that gonna be? It's gonna be a rect. What I might do is I'm, I'm gonna try and define these because they, they're gonna be useful to get these values as um, variables so that I can use it to do some hit testing and stuff in a sec as well. So I'm gonna go x, y width height, which is, which I'm gonna define now. So we're gonna let x equal 120 plus, um, plus i times 40 or something like that. Let y equal to, um, I'm just gonna go with width over two for now. So that's gonna be the center of, I mean, actually that should be height. Height over two, which is just gonna be the center of the screen. It's gonna be a nice centered xylophone. 
We want to let the width of each block is going to always be the same at about 40, 40 pixels wide. And I want to let the height of the block, um, let's start with 100. And what we're going to do is vary this over time. So at the moment, I can see all of my all of my xylophone blocks are lined up there. I really want a bit of space in between them. So I do want to make that a bit bigger, but I also want, that's too much space to maybe a hundred. Still too much, might do 80. That looks approximately okay. And I want them to be a bit thicker. So maybe 70. So there's a bit of a gap between each of the, each of the, I don't even know what you call them, dingers, the xylophone dingers. And also if we look up, if we, if we search for a xylophone on Google images, we can see that there's, there's this relationship between pitch and length, where as you get deeper in pitch, the blocks get longer. This is a good example right here. Um, and so we wanna have something that, you know, has that kind of quality as well, where it gets longer as it gets deeper. So for the height, I'm not just gonna leave it as a, um, you know, as a single value. I want to make it, I wanna to add to it with the I value, which is going to, I'm gonna say I times 20. How are we looking? Okay, so this looks okay, but I noticed in that xylophone I looked up before that they were kind of centered. So it just kind of gets wider on one edge and hold on. So yeah, something like that. And so what I really want to do at the moment is remove half of this value from the, the Y value. So I'm going to subtract, um, I'm going to subtract I times 10. Okay. So what we get is now a series of blocks that grow in this relationship and it's centered around this central bar. So, you know, I, I feel like they could be a little bit longer than they currently are. So I might just play around some values here, 50, um, 50, me, so 25 will be half of that. There's no rules that say it has to, you know, be, have this kind of relationship, but it works out okay. I want to change some aesthetics of this, um, of this, you know, this sketch as well. So I'm going to change the stroke weight to um, to four, four pixels wide. That looks a little bit better to me and hopefully it makes it a little bit more visible to you guys on the, on the lecture. So now what I want to do is I want to set the fill of these. Um, I want to say fill is equal to um, I'm going to say 255.00 for now, so just so they're all red. Okay, but we don't really want them all to be red. And really what we're heading towards is something that's interactive. So we need to give some feedback visually as well as to whether we're highlighting this, whether whether our mouse is hovering over the, um, hovering over the xylophone dinger. So I want to say for each of these, um, if... If our mouse x is uh, is greater than x, and our mouse x is less than x plus width, then uh, then the fill is going to be red, which is we've got just here. And otherwise, else. We'll make it um, we'll make it white for now. Okay, so now what we should have is as we run our mouse along, it highlights when we're hovering over it. Um, you know that that image that we had before, it it was kind of like a toy rainbow um, xylophone, which you know is a bit is a bit childish, but I think that's a nice way of indicating also pitch. So. Why don't we do some stuff to make that happen as well? So I'm going to set the I'm going to set the color mode 
to get a rainbow color palette, it's a lot easier to use a color mode of HSB. 360 is going to be the, um, the hue value out of 360, and then 100 for saturation and 100 for brightness. And now it's gonna change all of my colors slightly, but what I want this to I want this to be I times something like 40 and then 100, 100 when we hover over it. So it should be, yep, approximately rainbowy. And just to make it more clear about what it is doing, but still giving us a kind of visual feedback, I'm gonna lower the, I think I wanna lower the brightness of, um, No, you know what I might do instead is I might actually, I think maybe with HSB, what happens if we lower the saturation? That's better. So what we have now is, I might even make it lower than that. So it's more like 30. It's kind of like these washed out keys that give us indication of color. And when we hover over them, they get darker. Okay, so we can, we're already giving some kind of useful feedback to our user about how these things work and what I want to do now is actually make some make some noises happen uh, so um, I've got this web note envelope example from the p5 website and I'm gonna copy some useful things from that I want I want to use an oscillator which I already have and an envelope and I'm not going to use the FFT in this instance and I want to use this note array, scale array as well, because that's actually going to help us play a major scale instead of just a bunch of random sounds. Uh, let's see, we can use a sine oscillator uh, in our setup. That's what we're going to set the OSC to. In fact, we can probably copy most of this. Okay, we're getting a noise there, that's nice. And that's good. But we want to, we want to actually, um, we want to play the note with the envelope. So what I might do is, if I just paste this into, well, if I paste it here, and what we'll get is, is we get now a note that starts off loud and gets quieter. That's called the envelope, and that's that's how you turn a kind of a simple oscillator into something that sounds more like a note. And what we want to do is um, is in addition to asking if we're hovering over it, we want to say if the mouse is pressed. Um, we could also do this with the mouse mouse pressed um, function, but in this case, I'm just going to use the mouse is pressed. Uh, uh oh, hope that doesn't run out of space. Um, if the mouse is pressed, we're going to play the OSC at this thing, and so what we should find is okay. So we can now click on any of these. If we click off, it's not going to work. But what we also want to do is, it's a, it's a xylophone, so what we really should be seeing is that uh, if, if, the, if we're clicking a different note, we're getting a different pitch. And so what I want to do is, uh, in this example, they're setting the frequency value using OSC Freak, or Freck, perhaps. Uh, and they're getting a, there's a function called MIDI to Freak, um, which comes from P5. Um, the P5 sound library, which is going to be useful because the MIDI values go one, two, three, four, five, and frequency values are actually, um, they're quite larger numbers and they have a nonlinear relationship. So, you know, another, an extra one point of frequency doesn't necessarily mean a note, a value on, on a kind of scale. And we're also going to take this scale array thing. And so, because that's what we borrowed from from up here, this scale array, which gives us a major scale. 
And so all we're gonna do down here is take the scale array and the note is gonna be out of, it's gonna be the I value. And that's gonna give us the if element of the scale array, turn it into a frequency and play that frequency, okay? Actually, if we want to get a full major scale, we're going to need eight notes. So add an extra one there. And we also, we think about this. I'm going to set the amp by default to zero and hopefully that won't affect, won't affect anything. That little clipping you can hear is the same issue that we're having with starting the um, starting the sound file repeatedly in the in the in the kind of draw loop, and so that's because we're actually getting several frames of mouse is pressed and therefore setting the frequency and playing the envelope before it kind of stops. And so one way that we can fix that in an instance like this where nothing's changing that fast is setting the frame rate. Uh, frame rate is going to be equal to 12 in this case, which is a standard old school um, animation frame rate. Okay, cool. So we've got a pretty simple xylophone here. Let's look at this uh, scale array. Now, if you know much about music theory, you know that a major scale goes, let me make this a bit larger, goes tone, tone, uh, tone, well, oh, it goes tone, tone, semitone, tone, 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 semitone. Uh, where semitone means you're going up by t uh, by one um, value of MIDI and, and a tone means you're going up by two. And so we could change this scale to be a minor scale by changing this 64 to a 63. And there's a couple of minor scales actually, um, but we're going to change this 71 to a 70. I think we need to change this to a 78. That might be the, that might be either the harmonic or the melodic mitre. I'm not entirely sure. So now with different pitches, we're getting a much darker kind of um, atmosphere from those notes. And when we Uh, whereas if we keep it with the um, with the major scale, I think this has to be a 79. It sounds much happier. Okay, so um, look, the last thing I want to do is to say, you know, we're making we're making an instrument here. We don't have to stick with uh, with the standards set out by you know instruments that already exist. It's a, it's a nice thing to do design-wise to draw inspiration from something and it helps our, our users understand the kind of interaction mode of what we've created. But it can be fun to experiment and think about, well, what would happen if we created, you know, what, what would happen if we had a, um, if for example, we had a, uh, a, um, a xylophone that was moving around as we were trying to play it and because we've set this all up very nicely with variables and so on, we can actually we can actually do something like that fairly easily. So this Y value, for example, um, let me pull this back over to the side. I can add a value to this and it's going to change both how the hitboxing is worked and also where it's drawn. And so for example, I could say sign, oops, so sin in, um, in P5. The sign value of frame count divided by 1000 or 100. And if I multiply that by something decent as well, say 200. Okay, so they're all going up and down at a certain rate. I think 100 was a bit too small to be honest. Uh, 10 is probably gonna be too fast. Uh, it's not too bad. And 100 is probably a bit much as well. Um, Wait, I just made that 100 again. Let's go 80. <clears throat> now this is all moving up and down. It's kind of like your xylophone is shifting along you know, as you're playing it, or maybe you're swaying around as you're using it. But what if we 
added to this frame count also a bit of the I value. Now all of our um, all of our motions are offset based on its position in the for loop. Okay, and so now we've got this kind of imaginary instrument that is kind of moving back and forward as we're trying to play it. We could go even more wild than this, right? We could add some of this um, sign value to the um, to the x to the x position and see see what happens there. Now we've got this kind of like ripple flag effect. Alternatively, we could try and do something with rotation, perhaps, um, where, well, you know what, how long have we been going for? I think we might have to call it there. Um, there's, there's kind of an abundance of things that, that we could try and do with this, um, with this approach. Really, I think if, we, if you approach the instrument and kind of start with something simple, something that makes sense to you, and then you know, just experiment and just see see what you can achieve. I'm sure, I'm sure you can find some kind of um, maybe slightly humorous, slightly more interact in, in, interesting interaction mode. Um, I'm going to call this lecture in that case and finish it off. Um, as I said, you can ask questions on discourse or on um, the on on teams and um i'll be sticking around for the next three weeks until charles martin is back and in the meantime i hope that was a interesting lecture for you guys and i will see you next week